Good morning. I don't know how that got on the bottom, but uh, okay. Good morning. Good to have you here today. And we're back in the Ten Commandments. And the title of... i am looking for my stuff. The title of today's message is... What's in a name? What's in a name? Now, we're going to be talking about using God's name. So let's pray. God, thanks. I pray you'll open our hearts to hear from you today, God, that our, my, my thoughts would be your thoughts, that my words would be your words, Father, and that you would keep us blessed, Father, keep our hearts open to you. Thanks, God. Amen. Yeah, when the 1960s ended, San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district reverted to high rent, and a lot of hippies moved down to Santa Cruz. They had children and got married, and they, not necessarily in that order, but uh, they didn't name their children Melissa or Brent. People of mountains around Santa Cruz uh, got accustomed to their children playing with Frisbee. Not with a Frisbee, with Frisbee. Or Time Warp. Or Spring Fever. And eventually Moonbeam, Earth. And Love and Precious Promise all ended up in public school. That's when the kindergarten teachers first met Fruit Stand. Every fall, according to tradition... Parents bravely apply name tags to their children, kiss them goodbye, and send them off on, to school on the bus. So it was Fruit Stand. The teachers thought the boy's name was odd, but hey, it's not any worse than Moonbeam or uh, Frisbee. So they try to do the best of it. You know, uh, Would you like to play with the blocks, Fruit Stand? And later, Fruit Stand, how about a snack? And he accepted hesitantly, but Fruit Stand never said a word the whole day. Later on, uh, as it's time to get to go, to, time to get ready to go, they said, uh, "Fruit stand, do you know which one is your bus?" He didn't answer. That wasn't strange. He hadn't answered them all day. Lots of children are shy on their first day of school. It didn't matter. The teachers had instructed the parents to write the name of their children's school bus on the one side, and their name on the other on the other side of the tag. The teacher simply turned over the tag, and there was. Neatly printed, Anthony. Poor fruit stand. I mean, Anthony. See, names are important to us, especially our own name. Our name is more than a means of identifying someone. It conveys information about our family, our social and economic status, our race, and sometimes religion, too. The mere mention of some names gets an immediate response. What if I said the name Saddam Hussein? or Donald Trump, or David Letterman. How about uh, John Gotti? See, those all have connotations along with their names. Have you ever named someone who named their, their baby boy Judas, or their baby girl Jezebel? It happens. And you wonder if they realize all the implications that come with that name. we got to be careful naming our kids biblical names too, by the way, because... Uh, Sometimes the name you think you've picked sounds cool, but it's not really a name you want to associate with your child. Names conjure up images that even non-religious people resist. If you've had kids, there were certain names you would not consider because they reminded you of someone you didn't like in school. Or we name our, we tend to name our kids things that we uh, people who feel good about. Names are important. A, ten, a third of the Ten Commandments we find God is protective of his name. We're commanded to, to, ex to proceed with extreme caution when we handle the name of Al the Almighty. Uh, look at Exodus 20, verse 7. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. The Lord's not going to let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. God is so concerned about the use of his name that there's a punitive action a promise of punitive action if it's used incorrectly. Literally, God said, don't use my name with emptiness. Don't take it up. Don't lift my name with emptiness. If you 
like me, you grew up in, as a kid reading the King James Bible, it said, do not take the name of your Lord, the Lord your God in vain. The word vain, the vain there means nothingness or trivial. To take God's name in vain means that there's, it's been treated lightly or, or insignificant. And if you look around today, we do it. I mentioned this Sunday in my message that we use God's name all too lightly. I hear Christians saying things like, oh God, why? Why are you doing that? Why would you use God's name like that? That's not what it's for. It's not to be used lightly. The Jews were very diligent concerning this commandment. God's name was so sacred that the Jews, to the Jews, that it was pronounced only once a year by the high priest, and that was when he was giving blessing on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It's, it's vital. When, when they were transcribing the scripture, when, they, when the, the priests would get to the name God, they would go, get a special pen. First, they would go and bathe, make sure, and then they would, they would write the name, just the name Yahweh, Jehovah, write it with a special pen, and then break the pen and start all over again. I'm, I'm telling you, we don't have that kind of reverence of God's name. And we should. Here's a little Bible lesson for you. If you're reading the Old Testament and come across the word Lord in all capital letters, that is the term, let me set this up here, that is the term Yahweh. Yahweh. Okay? That's God's covenant name with Israel. Yahweh basically means the one who is. And then you'll see the term Lord. That's Jehovah, Adonai, Yahweh. So you see the word Lord, it's Yahweh. And, and see how Yahweh is spelled? They took out the vowels because they didn't feel like it was right for them to, to write God's name completely. I had a Jewish lawyer uh, in my church in, not in my church, he was doing work for our church in uh, Gardena, and my last name is Godsey, G-O-D-S-E-Y. No, it's not a professional name, although I've been asked that. It's the name my mama and my daddy gave me. Whenever he was, whenever he was writing, he was like, you know, dear Mr. Godsey, dear Reverend Godsey, he would spell it capital G underscore D-S-E-Y. And the only time the word Godsey was spelled out was in a place where I had to sign for a legal document. Other than that, it was always capital G underscore D S E Y. Because my name contains the name of God, and he was not going to use God's name lightly. So, what's the big deal with God's name? Why do we have to take it so seriously? Well, giving, luck, giving God a bad name might diminish or demolish people's, uh, people's, I'm sorry, might diminish. <sighs> Giving God a bad name might diminish or demolish people's belief, respect, and awe for God. A tragedy for a world that needs holiness. Taking God's name, not taking him seriously, determines how others view God. Understand, your non-Christian friends are watching you to see God. And you're walking around using God's name indiscriminately. What does that tell them about your reverence for God? See, your character affects God's credibility. C.R. Smith was one of the founders of American Airlines, and he once made a stopover in Nashville, Tennessee. When he did, he found two desks in the American Airlines corridor of the airport. On one, a phone was ringing, ringing, ringing. Sitting at the other with his feet propped up was a man reading the newspaper a man who worked for American Airlines. Smith walked up to him and said, your phone's ringing. That's reservations, the man said. I'm maintenance. Furious, Smith walked over to the desk, picked up the phone, began talking to a man who urgently needed to get to California. Smith rattled off the schedule from memory to the man and hung up. The man from maintenance couldn't believe it. Hey, that was pretty good, he said. Do you work for American? Yes, I do, Smith answered. And you used to. See, 
He wore American Airlines and the name on his shirt. He worked for American Airlines. He represented American Airlines. Don't give me this, it's not my job stuff. Your job is to represent American Airlines. Do it and do it well. Now, I want to give you something. There are three ways that we can break this commandment. Three ways that we can break this commandment. First of all, and I'll split the screen with you. So, First of all, we honor or dishonor God with our lips. This is how most of us misidentify or misuse God's name. It's become very common to hear God's word used as a byword or even as a part of profanity. I want you to think about that today. How many times today have I said the name God or the word God without reverence for the Almighty, without the reverence that I need to show for the person that has done so much for me? We honor or dishonor God with our life. Maybe you've never thought much about this one, but your life honors or dishonors God. Our life is an indicator of how seriously we take our Christian walk. And if you haven't heard it yet, I'm not just plugging it because it's my message, but if you haven't heard it yet, go back and listen to Sunday's message called Giving God Your Best because we've got to give God our best. And right now, a lot of times we just say, ah, good enough. And again, if your non-Christian friends are seeing this, what does that tell them about your relationship with God? Eh, yeah, God's there, but eh, it's good enough. That's eh, good enough. If you believe in God as a creator, then you've got to accept that he knows best and that we then, when we live contrary to his plans, his principles and his rules, we are dishonoring our creator. I've been doing a lot of, of, of work on a thing called heart physics. And it's, it's an amazing concept. And I'm not going to go into it because I'm still learning. But one of the things they said was, our whole sense of our Christian walk and everything else judge, deals with how we feel God feels about us. Now, how do you think God feels about you? Do you think that God doesn't like you because you sin? Or that God's always looking down on you and, you know, God's wait, just waiting to damn you to hell. God's word doesn't say that. In fact, God's word says the opposite. God's word says that he loves us. He loves us with undying love. We always want to pray, God, I want more God. You can't get more God. God's given you all the God you have, all the God you need, because he's made himself totally available to you. So here's the thing. If you're thinking of how God feels about you and what God's word says about how God feels about you, if those are at odds, you've got to decide. Do I believe God or do I believe me? If you believe you, you're sinning. And more than that, you're arrogant. Who are you to say that God is wrong? That was an aside. It didn't cost you anything. Third way we dishonor God is we, dis we honor or dishonor God with our loves. What do you love? What do you love? What, what, is, what is the most important thing for you to love? Now, so much of the Ten Commandments hinges on the first couple. That's why Jesus said, in Matthew 22, 37 through 40, Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And second one is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. The bottom line is you love what you live for. What's in your heart when you worship? For some of you, it may be your work or relationship or things about our loves. They tell us a lot about keeping our, our, our keeping of this commandment. Do you put God first? 
Is God getting your best? See, Jesus said that where we find our treasure is where we'll find our heart. So, let's talk about some ways that we misuse his name. All right? Some ways that we misuse his name. First of all, vacant vows. Look at Ecclesiastes 5, 4, and 7. When you make a promise to God, don't delay in following through. For God takes no pleasure in fools. Keep all the promises you make to him. It's better to say nothing than to make a promise and not keep it. (coughs) Don't let your mouth make you sin. And don't defend yourself by telling the temple messenger that the promise you made was a mistake. That would make God angry. And he might wipe out everything you have achieved. Talk is cheap. Like daydreams and other useless activities, fear God instead. This is really what the letter of the law is all about. God assumed that his people would invoke his name when taking oaths. I swear before God that blah, blah, blah. God's point is that when you take up his name in an oath, if you make that that oath, you better follow through with it. Because if you don't, you're, you're, you're showing that you are unfaithful to God. Excuse me. You're unfaithful to God. And then the, the temple messenger would come and say, hey, you said that you would come and do this today. Oh, well, that, I made that vow my mistake. God's not going to take that well. See, he is faithful and he expects his followers to be faithful as well. Jesus took it a step further. By his day, the Jewish people had established an informal system of oath-taking. Check this out. If you swore by God, you were bound to it. But if you wanted to weasel out of your vow, you could make it on, make it, uh, you could promise on something or someone else. For example, you could say, I swear in my mother's grave. When you wanted to escape that vow, you would later follow it up with, ha ha, she's still alive. Oh. Hello? She what? Okay. The closer your vow was to God, the more seriously you had to take it. The further away from God and his name you moved, the more latitude you had with the truth. I swear by the sons of Warfan. I just watched Galaxy Quest. Sorry, that was the first thing that came to my head. I swear by the sons of Warfan. Well, now you're way away from God. You're way away from reality. And Jesus said, yeah, it's kind of stupid. Look at Matthew 5, 33 to 37. Again, you've heard that the law of Moses says, don't break your vows. You must carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say, don't make any vows. If you say by heaven, it's a sacred vow because heaven is God's throne. So he's just thrown that away now. Look, don't even, don't even try to say by heaven. That's, that's God's throne. And if you say by the earth, it's a sacred vow because earth is his footstool. And don't swear by Jerusalem for it's the city of the great king. Don't even swear by my head, for you can't turn one hair white or black. Just say a simple yes, I will, or no, I won't. Your word is enough, or should be. To strengthen your promise of the vow shows that something is wrong. You know, a lot of times, it's kind of a rule in law enforcement that the more often, more often a guy says, honestly, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. He's not. He's lying. Again, your character affects God's credibility. People are watching you. They're hearing your vows. Oh, I had a great church service Sunday. Bless God. Hey, Bob, you're supposed to do this. Oh, oh. You affect God's credibility. If you want people to be be one to the Lord, then your life has to live according to the Lord and according to the vows and according to all the things that you do. Next is abrasive speech. In a technical sense, profanity is not a violation of the third commandment. In fact, according to the letter of the law, unless you pronounce the covenant name of God, we don't know how to pronounce it anymore. You can't violate that specific point of the law. But don't use this as a cop-out. The letter of the law might not get you, but the spirit of the law will. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you carry around the name Christian, which means like Christ. Your words reflect the character of your Lord. 
That's why there is a specific prohibition about profanity. Ephesians 5, 4, obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes, those are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. See, your character affects God's credibility. The words you say shape other people's opinions about God's reputation. And again, I will, fl- I will add into this, I believe it's a profanity, oh God, or Jesus Christ, or oh Lord, or oh my God. Now, if you're actually speaking to God, okay, that's great. But if you're just using that as a, as a, if you're like not using that God's name reverentially, and if you're just using it to prove a point, it's profanity. Profanity. Don't do it. Profanity literally means away from the temple. Profanity occurs when we take something sacred, like the name of God, and treat it irreverently. Romans 12 Four and five, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong together. You don't have the right to tell God to damn anything. I was working on a car with a guy one time and he yelled for God to damn the piece he was working on. And I looked at him and said, you don't really want that. You're having enough trouble with it. it is. If God damns it, it's really going to be bad. Profanity really says something about the person who uses it. I like this quote. Profanity is the use of strong words by weak people. Wow. I used to tell my kids that stupid people use profanity. Because they can't, they're not smart enough to think of other words to express their, their feelings. Jesus said that the words we use expose what's inside of us, for better or for worse. Luke 6, 45, a good person produces good deeds from a good heart and an evil person produces evil deeds from an evil heart. Whatever is in your heart determines what you say. How? How about inconsistency between words and deeds? This commandment goes beyond our words. The way you live can be a smear in the name of God. Speaking to religious hypocrites, the author of Romans wrote, Romans 2, 21 and 24, well then, if you teach others, why don't you teach yourself? You tell others not to steal, but do you steal? You say it's wrong to commit adultery, but do you do it? You condemn idolatry, but do you steal from pagan temples? You're so proud of knowing the law, but you dishonor God by breaking it. No wonder the scriptures say the world blasphemes the name of God because of you. I do not want to have a name where uh, a life that that makes somebody look at him and say, look at me and say, I don't want to be a Christian because of that guy. I want the opposite. I want somebody to look at my life and say, I'd like to be a Christian like Jerry Godsey. Years ago in Germany, there was a young Jewish boy who had a profound sense of admiration for his father. His family's life centered on the acts of piety and devotion prescribed by their religion. The father was zealous in attending worship and religious instruction, and he demanded the same from his children. While the boy was a teenager, the family was forced to move to another town in Germany. There was no synagogue in the new town. He was Jewish. No synagogue in the new town. And the pillars of the community all belonged to the Lutheran church. Suddenly, the father announced to the family they were going to abandon all of their Jewish traditions and join the Lutheran church. When the stunned family asked why, the father explained not that he'd had a religious conversion, but that changing religions was necessary to help his business. The youngster was bewildered, confused. His due... His deep disappointment soon gave way to anger and a kind of intense bitterness that plagued him throughout his life. That disappointed son, disillusioned by his father's lack of integrity, eventually left Germany and went to England to study. He sat daily at the British Museum formulating various ideas and writing a book. In that work, he introduced an entirely new worldview. He envisioned a movement that would change the social and political systems of the world. Drawing from past experiences from his father, He described religion as an opiate for the masses. Sound familiar? 
an opiate for the masses that could be explained totally in terms of economics and personal gain. Today, millions of people still live under the system invented by this embittered man, and millions more suffered under previous regimes that incorporated his values. Untold millions of lives have been lost, all by the philosophies of that young man. His name is Karl Marx. Karl Marx and the communism and all the evils that have come with it all started because his father misused God for profit. Scary, isn't it? How about a non-existent relationship with God? It's possible to go through the motions of religion and church life and be utterly devoid of a vital connection with Christ. We talked about this Sunday. You can know all the words, you can do the hands, you can do all the stuff, but if it's not in your heart, it doesn't count. Look at Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not all people who sound religious are really godly. They may refer to me as Lord, but they still won't enter the kingdom of heaven. The decisive issue is whether they obey my Father in heaven. On judgment day, many will tell me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I'll reply, I never knew you. Go away. The things you did were unauthorized. Some people use God's name for personal gain. God's name has been invoked to sanction all kinds of evil, such as the Crusades during the Middle Ages, slavery in America, the Nazi agenda in Germany, segregation in the South, and even American militarism. We must be very, very careful. Just because we are Americans doesn't mean that God sanctions everything we do around the world. And that's a harsh fact. Beware of those who take up God's name in a cause, but don't have any real relationship with him. That includes the people we vote for. Everything. Misuse of God's name for personal profit is easily applied to certain televangelists who use the name of God to make a buck. It was widely known that former President Richard Nixon courted evangelist Billy Graham's personal friendship for political advantage. When Billy read the Watergate transcripts for the first time, chock full of Nixon's profanity, manipulations, cover-ups, and power plays, he became so upset that he went into the bathroom and vomited. It can happen with average people to start a real relationship with Christ. You don't have to pretend. All you have to do is call in the name of the Lord for forgiveness and begin following him. Make sure your relationship is real because your character, what? Affects God's credibility. Rather than follow the Jewish path and avoid even mentioning the name of God, let's go the opposite direction. And let's intentionally take it up. But keep in mind whose character we're representing. This commandment, is all about respect and reverence for God. When you and I really grasp and embrace who God is, it makes a profound and radical difference in how we live our lives. No longer can anyone accuse us of being one-day Christians. Our lives on Monday through Saturday will match up with our actions and our words on Sunday. Let the way you speak and act live more closely reflect the one you believe in and follow. Look at Colossians 3.17 says, Whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to Him through giving thanks through Him to God the Father. We've got to constantly evaluate our words and attitudes and deeds and ask ourselves if they're God honoring. What does my conversation imply about my God? Is how I'm treating this person in line with how Jesus responded to people? Am I going after personal purity that reflects the holiness of the Lord? The pastor decided that all of his Sunday school teachers had to be right. So he called a Sunday school teacher into his office. You might be surprised to find out that the Sunday school teacher's name was Willie Nelson. Yes, that Willie Nelson. To all the girls I've loved before. Yeah, that one. Pastor said, Willie, you either quit playing in beer joints or else you quit teaching Sunday school. 
Nelson replied, you must be nuts. But the pastor didn't back down. Nelson later recalled, he had to choose between satisfying a congregation, including the hypocrites, or siding with a uh, musician who drank and smoked and cussed and picked his guitar and sang in dance halls. I decided to stay with the beer joints. He also went on to say, the preacher sounded so wrong to me that I quit the Baptist church. And he goes on, he talks about how he found a whole group of people who believe in reincarnation and and that the King James Bible was was written later to cover up the fact that Jesus discovered reincarnation, the Aquarian gospel, they call it. He said, it had a great impact on me. It explained everything to my satisfaction. Compromise never leads you to an oasis. It just destroys. It just deceives you with a mirage. Follow God's example. Go over and above what's expected. Truly represent God and honor his name. And we are to stand out as beacons of light. Matthew 5, 16, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that the heavenly father, so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. Christ is not looking for part-time followers. Start keeping this commandment. Here we go. I'll guard my language at all times. I'll develop a respect for God and who He is. I'll live my life so that it's a reflection of God. I will search for God daily through prayer. If you will just do those four things, God will do something great in you. This is a challenge. The Ten Commandments are a challenge. We always think of them as, oh, something that's written on tablets and you find on the, on the wall of the, of, of, the, of the courthouse. No, they're a lot, lot more than that. Okay? We got a lot to work, to work on, don't we? Got, the, got a lot to chew on. That's okay. You can do it. God believes in you and so do I. Let's pray. Father, thanks. God, you are so good to us. And I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy and your love for us. God, help us now to do the right thing, to do what needs to be done. Thanks, God. Give us reverence for your name. Give give us a life that shows that reverence. And more than anything else, Father, be pleased with us. Thanks, God. We ask it in your name. Amen. I'd like to tell you it gets easier from here, but it don't. See you next week. Bye.